So um, <clears throat> we're going to be um, shifting for a couple of sessions to talking about uh, Victorian women's issues starting next time. We'll actually begin some of that shift, I think, today as we examine um, the characters of the Stoner sisters in this particular story um, and their relationships in particular with their stepfather and with other men who are mentioned in the narrative. Uh, but yeah, so next time you're going to be reading um, an excerpt from a women's conduct manual, um, a very bad poem that was nonetheless very popular um, that <clears throat> a poet wrote in praise of his wife. And a lot of the compliments will seem to us to seem almost kind of backhanded, uh, but you know it's kind of time and time and distance will do that, right? Um, and the third piece you're going to be reading for next time is a letter to the newspaper uh, written by a woman claiming to be a prostitute, um, who is um, talking about how how one falls into that particular life and kind of like what. Um, what the social circumstances that create uh, supply and demand in that particular industry are. Um, I do want to remind everybody as well about the importance of being earnest going up this weekend. Uh, completely free to anyone with a GSW ID. Um, starts Thursday, runs through Sunday. You will get extra credit if you go. So please go. Um, okay. So let's just quickly go over the vocab uh, from last week. And then we'll get into Arthur Conan Doyle. All right, so Sanskrit and Arabic. Significance here. That was from the Macaulay piece, um, mm -hmm. Minute on Indian Education. And yep. he was arguing, well, I mean, he kept calling it Arabic, but it was really Persian. Yeah. And he basically <laughs> was saying that they should be educated in English instead of like the native languages of India. Uh huh. Which, yes, yeah, Sanskrit isn't actually anyone's native language. It's actually it's primarily a literary language. Um, but yeah, it is the, uh, the language that most important um, Hindu scriptures, for example, are written in. Yeah, but um, yeah, it, it's the, these are the, the languages that uh, Macaulay doesn't himself speak or read, right? But believes to be inferior uh, to English. All right, what's an allegory? It's a story with two, or two more levels of meaning, uh, one in literal, and then another is like a symbolic meaning that yes. um, points to something that's outside of it. Yeah. And what would be the text that was be most, what would be most relevant for this? Probably your Christmas Carol with the ghosts and their appearances. Yeah, with an allegory, the symbolism has to be intentional, right? So I know somebody put the T.M. Mukherjee piece because he's kind of like writing on two levels for two different audiences, but he's not couching, uh, he's not couching it in, in specific symbolism, right? So with allegory, yeah, the, 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 the key difference there is that it is intentional symbolism. So something like the empty rusty scabbard, for example, in a Christmas story is clearly allegorical. And let's just jump right to that. What is the empty, rusty scabbard? What's this, what is and what's the significance of it? It's the ghost of Christmas present. It was the, um, it holds a knife, but it uh -huh. represents peace because there is no knife there within it. So. Yeah, and the fact that it's rusted means that we've had long peace, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so th th this, this, is a, like a, this is an example of an allegorical object, right? Yeah, on the literal level, yeah, it's just an empty scabbard, right? But it symbolizes something outside. All right, good. All right, crown colony. What was a crown colony? It was one of the colonies um, ruled by Great Britain. Uh -huh. That was directly ruled by Great Britain, by Jamaica. Yeah, crown colony was ruled by an appointed governor, right? Rather than by a corporate board um, or, you know, a, an advisory body like a protectorate would have been, right? So, um, yeah, Jamaica is a good example of a crown colony, right? Um, somebody put India down as a crown colony and uh, listed Mac uh, like Macaulay as the text. I took a little bit off for that.
because India wasn't a crown colony at the time Macaulay wrote his minute, right? Mm -hmm. India is only a crown colony after 1857. Okay. Prior to that, it's run by the East India Company, basically. All right, Alterity. Yeah, where is the one on the other miss? Yes. Um. <laughs> Definitely in Macaulay. <laughs> okay. Which is um, when he's talking to the British people and he's like, oh, you only want white me because I'm, of my blackness. Oh, you like, mean uh, the Mukherjee? Or Mukherjee, yes, Macaulay, but I don't know. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Well, yeah, Mukherjee's visit to Europe, yeah. He's, mm -hmm. he's constantly made aware of and often kind of makes sly use of his otherness, right? So yeah, good. All right, the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The, the ghost with the most words in his name. <laughs> I have a quick question, backtracking for just a second. Yeah. So what was our text for Crown Colony then if it wasn't the Macaulay piece? Um, you probably could have used the Macaulay piece for that, just not mentioned India as a Crown Colony. Okay. Yeah, um, or even the, the, the Mukherjee piece, because right? by the time Mukherjee is writing, India is okay. a problem. The ghost of Christmas yet become is like, it's like he's wearing this black robe, so mm -hmm. it's like the un recognized future, yeah. like you don't know what's going to happen, uh -huh. and then he's always pointing forward yep. to the future, <laughs> um, and then he leads Scrooge to his grave, um, uh -huh. but, and then which is going to happen anyway, yeah, right? so, yeah. there's no sponge of the words off that stone, I mean, yeah. I that's <laughs> and the death of um, Tiny Tim, yes. but yes. all the events he's showing, he doesn't say when they're going to happen, he just says they will happen, exactly, yeah, yeah. You were even yet. Yeah, you don't know if they're happening at the same Christmas, you know, or how far in the future. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So this is another uh, clearly allegorical figure, right? All right. Good. Contrapuntal reading. Oh, that was like reading it from the perspective of like the marginalized group. So like if you were mm -hmm. re reading something like a Jane Austen piece, like yeah. where was all this money coming yeah. from, or something like, <laughs> yeah, things like that. Reading it with an awareness of where Mr. Darcy got his fortune, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. And you know, you could probably relate this to any of the colonial uh, texts that we've looked at. I mean, not directly, but kind of like, you know, it's, it's all in the same vein. All right, Tiny Tim. He like resembled loneliness to Scrooge because he uh -huh. also was a lonely child, and so he kind of related yeah. to him in that way. Uh -huh. um, he also was the son of, um, the, was it Cratchit? Mm -hmm. um, Bob Cratchit. Yep. Yeah. And I think we can also kind of relate Tiny Tim to the larger economic argument mm -hmm. of A Christmas Carol, right? because what's the real cure for Tiny Tim's an ailment? Population surplus. The, um, basically just let them starve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's what, yeah, that, that's, the, that's what Scrooge would have done at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. When Tiny Tim is just, you know, this kind of abstract number to him. But yeah, what is the thing that Tiny Tim needs in order to get better? Money. Yeah. <laughs> he needs for Scrooge to pay his father more, right? So yeah, it's, you know, again, part of that argument for getting middle class people to open up their pocketbooks, mm -hmm. right? All right, the Indian and Colonial Exhibition of 1886. It was like a festival hosted mm -hmm. um, by Great Britain. To, it was mainly up to for the like to showcase like the Indian people that were coming uh -huh. their um, empire. Yeah, um, this is where Mukherjee came and mm -hmm. he was experiencing all the the British people <laughs> and how they were. Um, uh huh. I don't know. They were just very strange people. They were. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kept approaching him and uh -huh. talking to him like he was a strange creature. Yeah. They also had like booths for all the goods with the signs of each country, but it was only uh -huh. those countries under the rule of the empire. Right. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And it's it like it, it played a big role in cementing this kind of like British identity, right? You know, that the that kind of cementing the empire and public acknowledgement that hey, we have an empire. Um, you know, in British consciousness. 
All right, good. And finally, one Ebenezer Scrooge. Mm. He was the main character in A Christmas Carol and was mm. like this mean old miser, and, and then he needed Jacob Marley to come back as a ghost and <laughs> have this whole, like, uh -huh. set all these ghosts up to take him through and mm -hmm. realize the error of his ways and that he needs to be more generous with other yes. people. Yes, yeah, so he, he, he's, he's the, 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 the prototype for the, um, you know, curmudgeonly old man who learns the true meaning of Christmas after a swift kick in the ass from some <laughs> spirit, right? <laughs> um, which <laughs> becomes a, you know, a pop culture trope. But um, what's Scrooge's set of beliefs He's at the beginning of the novella, and how do they evolve? Um, first, he's like materialistic, like, um, or not material, you, you know, mm -hmm. material in his views, like mm -hmm. he has to see it to believe it, yeah. especially like with the ghosts of Marley. Uh -huh. um, and then he kind of grows to accept that time isn't just money, it's also uh -huh. for like pleasure. And, yeah. All right. Um, and the other thing to note as well is, again, like going back to the Tiny Tim thing, right? How he needs to learn how to sympathize with other people again, right? To be less solitary and to develop a stronger identity through identification with others, right? So we've got another kind of sensibility narrative here, right? Even, you know, after, um, you know, sensibility had supposedly fallen out of fashion. All right, great. So let's get into what you read for today. Uh, what do you think of this? I enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> um, it was kind of fun, kind of solving what was going on. Uh huh. While we're doing it. I yeah. really never thought the Jared was an actual snake. <laughs> I was like, what? It was it was an interesting reading, but I was like sitting in my room and I was like by myself and I'm like every sound and I was like oh. it was freaking me out. <laughs> you, you hear you hear a middle clanging clanging a hiss and yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think and I think part of one of the things that um, that Doyle does is make effective use of a kind of red herring, right? Leading you to believe, he kind of gives you, right, some false clues regarding the word band. Right, he plays on the ambiguity of this particular word to make you think, initially, that it refers to a band of people who wear brightly colored clothing, right? So, you know, he initially, um, you know, suggests that this is a reference to the Romany people whom um, Roiland allows to wander his grounds, right? But what he's actually, what it actually refers to is, yeah, the shape of the snake, right? This is banned kind of, kind of more in, um, like, in terms of like a strap or a ribbon, right? Not a group of people. And the red herring um, is a really important convention of the genre in which this story was written. But before we kind of go on with this, I do kind of want to gauge um, whether you saw any similarities between this and things that we've read or discussed before. The way he talks about Dr. Roycott is like the way he describes him. Like uh -huh. He had big brown hands and a large <laughs> nose, like he was uh -huh. um, kind of picking him out among the rest of the people in a way. Okay. Yeah, what does Roylet almost seem like? Like, let's actually let's go to his physical description and see what we think of this.
Can I get somebody to start reading um, page 28, or 928, not 28. Mm -hmm. um, starting with, um, the ejaculation had been drawn from my companion. I can do it. Thank you. The ejaculation had been drawn from my companion by the fact that our door had been suddenly dashed open and that a huge man framed himself in the aperture. Mm -hmm. His costume was a peculiar mixture of the professional and of the agricultural, having a black top hat, a long frock coat, coat mm -hmm. and a pair of high gaiters, with a hunting crop swinging in his hand. So tall that his hat actually brushed the crossbar of the doorway, and his breadth seemed to mm -hmm. span it across from side to side. A large face seared with a thousand wrinkles, burned yellow with the sun and marked with every evil passion, was turned from one, uh, one to the other of us while his deep-set, bile-shot eyes and his high, thin, fleshless nose gave him somewhat the resemblance to a fierce old bird of prey. All right, thank you. Um, so let's think about this description for a second and what it kind of, like, what features, uh, what, like, what physical features of Dr. Roylet are emphasized here? and what they might suggest about the way we're supposed to read this guy. His wrinkles and his okay. nose. Okay. What draws you about the wrinkles in the nose, baby? Um, they're burned yellow with the sun uh -huh. and marked with every evil passion. <laughs> <laughs> um, marked with every and, evil passion. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the nose was thin and fleshless. And it was resembling like a beak of a bird, I'm assuming. Uh -huh. All right, so he's got a yeah, bird-like nose. His skin is burned yellow, right? What else is potentially physically important about this guy? He's very tall. He's, yeah, he's, he's very <laughs> tall, right? Yeah. He's extremely tall. And also, like incredibly strong, right? I mean, what does he do right there in Holmes's uh, sitting room? Bend the iron yeah, poker. Yeah, he grabs an iron fireplace poker and bends it with his bare hands, right? Mm -hmm. And then Holmes nonchalantly bends it back because, of course, he can do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <Sherlock Holmes>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, and what do, what do we know about Roylet's behavior and about his history? He's very aggressive. Okay, yeah. Well, what, and what, what incidents have shown how, how aggressive he is? Uh, the marks on um, his daughter. Okay, yeah. There are, the, there are marks on Helen's arm, right? Mm -hmm. Which she's been covering up. which are signs of physical abuse, right? And what, kind of coupled with that, what do we know about what Helen and Julia always do before they go to sleep at night? Lock their doors. They lock their doors, yeah. Probably to protect themselves from him, right? So there's a kind of veiled suggestion that Dr. Roylet uh, may be like, sexually abusive as well, right? Where else have we seen evidence of his strength and aggression? There are two more incidents that I'm thinking of here. Well, he killed someone in India. Yeah, he beat a man to death in India, right? Relationship like with the locals in uh, in Surrey? Nobody wants to come near him. They're all afraid of him. Yeah, everybody's afraid of him, right? We know, like, yeah, he he picked up the local blacksmith and threw him over a wall, right?
So this is what we know about his behavior, right? And about his physical presence. Now, I think it's also kind of worth drawing out a little bit about his history as well. So, what about his family history? The male, the male, the male. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> yeah there, there seems to be a, a strong um, uh, kind of hereditary aggression, right, maybe, right? But yeah, like, um, what, what kind of family does he come from on the whole? If we were kind of like putting them, like placing them in a, in a social class rank. I said it was like they were aristocratic paupers, like they had run out of money, but they like yeah. still had the estate technically. Yeah. He comes from a kind of like a poor gentry kind of background, right? Impoverished gentry. Um, so they still own this great big house, right? You know, that was the family seat. But all the money's gone. So he's part of a kind of like degenerate aristocracy. And how did he respond in his youth to his family's lack of money and prospects? What did he do? Didn't he go to a relative and get the money to go to medical school? Yeah, he went, yeah, he, he got his med, he had a medical degree and then took off to India, right? then seems to be where his life and fortunes turn, right? This seems to be where the aggression in him comes out, right? So this, it's the, this is the first sign in his history of the kind of violent temper that he exhibits later in the story, right? When he beats his butler to death uh, because his house keeps getting robbed. And it spends a little time in prison marries an English woman in India, and then they come back to England with the two daughters, right? Wife dies in a train accident. Maybe a little mysterious, right? <laughs> and the wife has left money that's under his control, right? But that is set aside for the daughters. So what happens if either of the daughters marries? They get 250 pounds. Yeah. They get a cut of that money, right? But only if they get married, right? Which shows, like, do either of the stoner daughters have control over their own money? No matter what happens, right? If they get married, it reverts to their husbands. So keep that in mind as well. But if we look at, again, Roylet's interest in all of this, so, the total income, the total inheritance that Royal have got is 1,100 pounds. So in today's dollars, that's 123,000 bucks. However, the investments now being much less valuable, they're now worth about 750 pounds, or the equivalent of about 84 grand. And if each of the daughters is owed 250 pounds upon their marriage, that's $28,000 each. So, if the daughters each get married, that leaves Roylet with only 250 pounds himself, right? So only $28,000 um, to keep him in that great big uh, drafty house that is apparently falling apart. More on the house in a moment. Um, but yeah, so he said, like, whereas if neither of the daughters ever marries, 
then he gets to keep the law, right? Did you notice anything weird about either the daughter's suitors? The guys that the daughters get engaged to? And one was like a, a soldier. And... Uh-huh. If we look at, yeah, let's, let's look for a second on page, yeah, 925 where that's mentioned, right? Where Julia went to this aunt's house at Christmas time and met there a half pay major of Marines to whom she became engaged. Is there anything strike you as funny about that sentence? She went to a relative's house for Christmas, and mm -hmm. they were there. Like they either had to be a really close friend, or they were probably some like cousin of some sort in uh, the family already. Which yeah, would in you know in an upper class family in the 1890s wouldn't have been that uncommon anyway, right? First cousin marriages were not necessarily rare. But let's look instead at the guy's profession. What does it say specifically about his profession? He's a half pay major. Yeah, half pay, right? So what does that mean? According, so according to the footnote, it's that he's on half salary um, because he's not on active duty, right? But what else then does that likely mean about him? I think it's also important to note here that both of the Stoner sisters by this point are 30 years old, right? And in 1892, what did that typically mean for your marriage prospects? Zero. <laughs> yeah. Slim to none, right? They also both look prematurely aged from the stress that they've been living under, right? So why does this half-pay major of Marines probably want to marry Julia? For the money. Yeah. <laughs> Because she's gonna, she's gonna get, she's gonna get some money when she gets married, right? That then goes to him. Now, there's another, I think, slightly telling passage um, that should make us pity the Stoner sisters in their situation on the very first page of the story here. Um, <clears throat> when Watson, who's narrating the story, um, tells us about the circumstances that allow him to tell it now. He mentions, right, the untimely death of the lady to whom the pledge of secrecy was given. So who must that lady be? It must be Helen, yeah. Who else would he have pledged secrecy to, right? And the death is untimely, meaning it's early and probably unnatural, right? So what does this suggest about this kind of weak and vacillating guy that Helen has uh, gotten engaged to? He's probably he's probably dead. Dead. Yeah, <laughs> he may very well have murdered her for the money, right? So yeah, neither whatever the outcome of Holmes's investigation, right? Neither of these sisters suffers a happy fate, and they're both kind of imprisoned by a lot of these kind of social codes um, involving inheritance, and also the legal fact that women didn't have control over their own money. Right. Their money is property of their stepfather until they marry, at which time it becomes property of their husbands. So even if they marry to get freedom from Roylet, right, they're still not free. Um, she, when she was telling Holmes and Watson about uh -huh. it, she mentioned like paying them that she didn't have it right now, but like when she got married and like a month yeah. ago, that she <laughs> have control of her own income, uh -huh. and then she'd be able to pay them. But you said that she wouldn't have really even had it controlled then. Not legally. No, the the, the, money, the money would have uh, yeah, the money would have belonged to her husband then. Right. Mm. 
But yeah, that's the, the, the only thing that gives these girls a chance, right, is this re actually relatively small amount of inheritance that they stand to get upon their marriage. So let's try to go back to earlier in the semester and see if we can connect this to a particular literary trope that we talked about um, early on in term. Does any of this seem familiar at all? If we think about Roylet and what he's like and the situation of the Stoner sisters. Kind of seems like we got it. Like female and male at the same time. Though. Uh -huh. Because Roylet would be like the male mm -hmm. in the way because he's like the early one uh -huh. and doesn't um, conform to all the society sure. rules. He's probably molesting his stepdaughters uh -huh. um, and he's getting away with it. Yeah. Um, he's kind of seen as an outcast in society. No one wants to come uh -huh. here. But then at the same time, the sisters, their life and virginity is being threatened the whole time. Yeah. 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 Their, their, their life, their money, their chastity, all of these are threatened by their stepfather. Yes, I think like because that particular plot is more important, this would probably be more of a female gothic right. kind of text than a male gothic kind of text. But yeah, this is absolutely borrowing a lot of tropes from the gothic um, and adapting them to a different set of social circumstances, right? Um, so what else, is there anything else in the story that seems uh, gothic? We've got this very threatening male, right? who is um, exerting his power over um, two kind of relatively weak women, right? Is there anything else about this that seems gothic? Um, the, was it terror that had the explainable yeah. um, occurrences? Okay, so about Scooby-Doo gothic, yep. Right. It's, it's, so it's terror, 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 yep. Um, like the noises that they were hearing. Yeah. Um, that they were like so terrified about. And then like the suspense um, like along the whole story is um, uh -huh. kind of what the gothic was doing, but in a more grotesque theme. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is very tame. Yeah, um, this, yeah, this, this is co yeah, comparatively tame, right? Yeah. Even with the potential, you know, sexual abuse subplot here, right? Yeah, this is compared to the gothic that like this is not nearly as over the top right right you know there's no you know no monks casting spells or shit like that right? <laughs> you know no no bandits hiding out in the hills and you know um, kidnapping women and things like that although there is that band of Romani roaming the grounds who are blamed initially uh, by Helen and by Holmes for what happened but they turn out to be they turn out to be innocent um, Anything else about this that seems gothic? Everything is happening at night. Okay, most things happen at night, yes. And the house is like a castle almost. Yeah, we've got this kind of crumbling castle-like house, right? Good. Complete with secret passageway, right? Now, granted, the secret passageway is not large enough for anything human or anything, say, larger than a snake to actually traverse, right? But yeah, um, <clears throat> I think you know, I think it still counts. And the house itself, right, is part of the mystery here. And so, kind of, kind of what we're seeing here is that, like, the modern detective story is a kind of direct descendant of the gothic tale of terror. And it's really, like, Conan Doyle doesn't invent the detective story, but he's the one that gives us uh, most of its conventional features, right? So what we have here is an important 
document in the history of what's called genre fiction. So are any of you familiar with this term? Anybody know what genre fiction is? Or how we distinguish genre fiction from quote unquote literary fiction? Okay, so say you go, uh, say you, you go to Barnes and Noble and you're browsing the shelves and you see, you know, there's a section for fantasy and science fiction there's a section for romance. There's a section for mystery, right? And then there's a section that's just labeled fiction. Now, if you go to one of those sections that's labeled, say, fantasy and science fiction, right? You have a pretty good sense of what you're going to get from that. Right? You know that the books on that shelf are going to follow a very similar set of conventions. Right? There's going to be a kind of set formula that they're going to follow. The same with romance or mystery, right? Whereas, you know, the books that on the that are simply on the fiction shelf, well, that could be kind of anything, right? But you know it's not going to be a mystery or a fantasy or science fiction or a romance, right? That's you know, not going to be one of those kinds of things. So genre fiction is a term that literary critics often use to kind of belittle um, texts that are written to a kind, like to what they think of as a kind of formula, right? Now, not all genre fiction is bad. A lot of it is. <laughs> but so is a lot of literary fiction, right? There's a lot of literary fiction that gets published that is dreck. So, genre fiction isn't necessarily better or worse than literary fiction in terms of quality, right? But it does often hew more closely to a particular set of conventions. So in this case, what we're looking at is a detective story. And the conventions that are set up, at least for the, the English detective story, right? it'll usually have most of these features, one, like one a remote country house setting. A place like Stoke Moore. One or more red herrings. Right? There'll be a couple of false leads that the detective will follow. There'll be a famous investigator, who at least is famous within the world of the text, even if, you know, it's say like his first adventure and you've never heard of him before, right? But he's always going to be somebody who is already within that world established and famous. There will typically be a large number of suspects, so that you will have to pay attention to clues and narrow it down, right? Now, one thing the Speckled Band doesn't have is a large number of suspects, right? There are really only a couple. Um, and it's really kind of more about figuring out the how than the who. There will usually be a scene in which the detective attempts to reconstruct the crime. Much like an M. Night Shyamalan movie, there will be an unexpected twist. Right. It's a twist. And the local officials are completely incompetent and have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> <clears throat> so the lo like you need to bring in your famous investigator because the local cops have already fucked this up, right? 
So this is what the typical late 19th century, early 20th century detective story looks like. And yeah, it shares a lot of features with the Gothic, right? Particularly with the female Gothic. And the primary publication venue for these kinds of stories um, were these kind of middle brow magazines. Does everybody know what I mean by middle brow? Like what that suggests? Okay, so if we're talking about something that's highbrow, what does that mean? Mm. Like a... I don't think about like a highbrow brand, like uh -huh. a luxury brand. Yeah. Louis Vuitton. Yeah, you're, you're, you're thinking along Louis the right line. Right. So yeah. like a middle brow would be like something, um, I don't know what's the middle brow brand. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but I think you're thinking along the right lines here. Like right. Who is this supposed to appeal to, right? right. So like a highbrow magazine is something that is intended to appeal to an educated elite with refined tastes, right? right. A lowbrow magazine would be like, you know, lots of dirty jokes and pictures of boobs, right? You know, it's, <laughs> um, you know be um, designed to appeal to the kind of lowest common denominator tastes, right? So the middle brow is somewhere in between. Right? So the middle brow um, isn't like dumb and or offensive like the low brow, but it's also not aiming as high as the high brow, right? So a middle brow publication is kind of aiming at, you know, a kind of moderately educated, literate audience. Of, if, you know, if it's a magazine that's not just pictures, and they kind of have to be literate. Um, but not one that is overly interested in things that are too arcane or abstract, right? So people who want to read, say, a good, clean adventure story, or maybe like you know a fairly moderate and conventional article about politics, right? And don't want to have a lot of um, you know high art nonsense or theoretical waffling behind it. Also, people who like things like crossword puzzles. So, the magazine that the home stories were mostly published in was called The Strand. And The Strand was um, an immensely popular ma uh, magazine with a transatlantic readership. So, at its height, its circulation was 500,000 in Britain. plus 150,000 in the US. So it's a British magazine. It's named for a street in London. Um, but it had a substantial US readership as well. Um, and it runs from January 1891 up until March 1950 when it ceases publication. And the first home story appears in the July 1891 issue. And home stories continue appearing until 1927 when, Conan, when Arthur Conan Doyle dies. No, he dies in 1930. So, up until shortly before his death. And the home stories are really central to the appeal of the magazine and its identity. And also we see the character shifting to respond to um, contemporary issues. So I just want to show you uh, some pictures of some covers of the of issues of the Strand that featured Holmes stories, and there were lots of them. And 
because the home stories were so popular, they're always advertised prominently on the cover. So generally what we get on the cover of the Strand is a picture of the Strand in London. And then, you know, some hints as to the content of the magazine. This is the September 1914 issue, and here's you know Holmes with his pipe, you know reading a note. Razor sharp jaw. Razor sharp, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very very pointed chin and nose, yeah. And if it, yeah, we're like so that um, an, Ill an illustrator by the name of Sidney Paget gives Holmes that kind of ca the characteristic look that is then kind of carried over into movies and other medium, right, where he's, he's tall, he's lean, he wears a deer stalker hat, um, and yeah, his face is very thin and pointed. And here we see that this is what I was talking about where the home stories kind of adapt themselves to the time. So, so this is September 1917. So instead of solving a conventional mystery here, Right? We're, in the, we're you know, getting close to the end of World War I. And here we have a story in which Sherlock Holmes outwits a German spy. And in fact, like a lot of the Holmes movies that were popular in the late 30s and 1940s with Basil Rathbone transplant Holmes from the 1890s or early 1900s into the 1940s. And they have him like, doing things like battling the Nazis or because he's British. He says he's battling the Nazis. So yeah, so the, yeah, the character and his activities change kind of based on the needs of the audience or the desires of the audience, right? And yeah, the kinds of things that the Strand published were these kinds of like middle brow adventure stories, um, relatively mild political content occasionally, mostly just kind of reporting rather than opinion, um, and puzzles, lots of puzzles. Now I mentioned the, uh, the illustrations here, so I do want to also uh, give you a look at what the illustrations in the original uh, publication of the story looked like. I also want you to just note how many illustrations there are here, right? And remember that the story is only about 17 pages long. So here we have Holmes and Watson meeting Helen Stoner for the first time. She lifts up her veil. Here we have Dr. Grimsby Roylet curling the blacksmith over the parapet. Julia Stoner in the moment before her death. Roylet threatening Holmes and Watson. Holmes and Watson getting in the uh, getting in the carriage to be taken to Stoke Morn. The examination of Roylet's room. There's a safe. Holmes and Watson taking their leave of Helen Stoner before they go to wait for her signal in the inn. Holmes smacking the bell pole with his cane to send the snake back into Roylet's room. And Dr. Grimsby Roylet dead and staring in his chambers, having been bitten by the snake. Uh, so the swamp adder, by the way, for those of you who weren't aware of this, is not a real snake. Um, and snakes do not actually behave the way Conan Doyle says they do in this story. He was a, a medical doctor by profession, not a zoologist. Um, so he did not realize that one, snakes don't actually drink milk. Um, so you can't, <laughs> you can't use a saucer of milk to train a snake. And another thing that makes it hard to train a snake, especially with something like a whistle, is that snakes are deaf. They can't actually hear. So yeah, that's... Another kind of fun thing. But did you notice just how many illustrations? There are nine illustrations in this very, very short story, right? 
So remember that like those gift books that um, Mary Shelley and people like her were publishing in in the early part of the century, to which the Strand is kind of, um, they're, they're kind of ancestors of things like the Strand. Um, you know, that Mary Shelley story had one illustration, right? So one thing we're seeing here is that the, techno the printing technology is getting cheaper, right? It's not as expensive to publish a magazine or illustrate it as it was in the 1830s. But it also shows that you know, maybe part of the draw here for more of the audience is pictures. The more pictures you give it, the more important it is, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, most stories in the strands in the strand were richly illustrated like this. And the weird thing is too that a lot of the incidents that Paget illustrates don't even seem to be particularly key or important or even that interesting, right? It seems almost like a random assortment of images. So I don't understand why we should illustrate them getting into the the car. And the yeah. And the yeah. yeah. Whereas like like things that would be kind of more interesting, like the like when the the, the, the baboon jumps out at them, right? right? We don't get a picture of that. We don't get a picture of the Romany wandering the grounds of the of the plantation, right? You know, it's we don't get a picture of Sto of the you know crumbling Stoke Morn, right? What we get are instead these relatively simple domestic scenes for the most part, which again also might speak to the kind of readership that the Strand had, right? Middle class, conventional, not particularly interested in intense sensation, right? So even when you've got these intense, you know, reading about these intense scenes in the story is one thing, but seeing it visually depicted might push the boundaries of taste a little. So the other thing that I want to note here, we're running close to time, there's just kind of one more thing I want to cover. What do you think of the baboon? Going back to that incident where the baboon jumps out of the bushes at them. He <laughs> says it looks like a child. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. So with the baboon, we've got an animal that kind of looks human, right? Mm -hmm. And with Roylet, we've got a human being who kind of looks like an animal and who associates with animals, right? So it's probably worth pointing out that Charles Darwin's two books, right, first on the origin of species, right, appeared in 1851. 1851 or, no, it's 1859. I got the numbers mixed up here. And The Descent of Man, had appeared in 1871. And these books were really, really big parts of Victorian discourse and like, like they were part of the culture of arguments um, in the era. Now, not necessarily in the way we might think, right? So, you know, we, there are still, you know, some who argue as to whether evolution is a thing or it isn't, right? But one of the big arguments that occurred, one of the big anxieties that Darwin's books caused in the Victorian period was that if evolution is possible, right? And what is evolution? Are we all familiar, basically, with what that means? What does it mean for something to evolve? Like change a, over a period of time. Yeah, to change over a period of time, usually into something more advanced, right? right? So if it's possible for something to evolve, it might also be possible for an organism to devolve, right? To degenerate into something worse, right? So the baboon might be a degenerate human, right? Or an ape that is evolving into a human being, right? And part of Darwin's theory is not that human beings evolved from apes, right? It's that human beings and apes evolved from a common set of ancestor species. Um, but 
Roylet is clearly a man on that kind of degenerative trajectory, right? Not only has his family been getting worse and worse and worse, generation to generation, but he himself looks and behaves like an animal. And his um, stay in India seems to have set that process off in him, right? The, ye the burned yellow skin is often the mark of an Englishman who's lived in the tropics, right? And where was I going with this? Uh, OK, so to connect this back, the scientific discourse to the imperial discourses that we've been talking about. Um, so Edward Said, who we've already met in a couple of um, contexts here, wrote a book called Culture and Imperialism. things that Said argues in culture and imperialism is that like not only can the colonial subject not ever fully integrate into the cultural center right so somebody like Olauda Equiano can't come to England and fully make himself into an Englishman he's always going to be other by the same token someone from the mother country cannot go out into the colonies, live there, and then come back and expect to fully reintegrate. They'll be marked by that experience as other, as different. And that seems to be what has happened to Roylet. Right? He cannot reintegrate into English society, right? He refuses any contact with his neighbors, he's violent, he's aggressive, he's fully alienated, right? And Said would, uh, might argue that this is a representation of the kind of the returned Englishman who can't be an Englishman anymore. It's like also a way to associate India with aggression and mm -hmm. animalistic. Absolutely, one hundred percent. It's yeah, that, that old Orient Orientalist discourse, right. right? Also, like the specific mentioning of how his skin was darker than theirs. Yeah. 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 And they make it an unattractive color too. Right. right? You know, it's a burnt. burnt yellow. Yeah. It's yeah. No, and like, you know, one thing that like I, I, I really appreciate how like y'all do make these connections between things that we've read and things that we've looked at. You know, even even when I don't prompt you <laughs> to do it. <laughs> no, um, so that's about all I have for you today. Um, we're about out of time, so let me give you the reading questions for next time. A seriously bad poem. <laughs> also, when you were saying and showing the, um, the illustration and how like Sherlock Holmes' his adventures became more like oriented with the time, like with the German spy, how you uh -huh. the German spy, made me think of um, how in like the eighties, how everything became Cold War centered, and how everything was like. Nazi, not Nazi, but like Russian. Yeah, um, yeah, the Russian. Yeah, I mean, even like, like, you, like yeah, like, even if you look at like pro wrestling. Right. I remember there was a there was a wrestler by the name of Nikolai Volkov. Who, like the guy wasn't even the, the guy who played Nikolai Volkov wasn't even Russian, but he was very dressed up in like the stereotypical um, like kind of Soviet garb. Yeah. And you know he was definitely supposed to be the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with Stranger Things on Netflix, but yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah.